Good morning. Welcome to Anticross Ministries Biblical Focal Points Online Worship Service. I'm Brother David. I'm going to be your host and your message deliverer for today. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Father, thank you for the technology that makes this possible. Lord, be with those who are seeking you. Be with those who are seeking your face. Give all of us the strength to repent, the strength to identify the sins in our lives and to turn away from them and walk back towards you. Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, to die on the cross to suffer the shame and the guilt of those sins. Help us to lay those things upon the cross where they belong. It's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. What's that I hear? What's that I hear? What is that? I hear church bells. to start the service. Be thou my vision. Be thou my vision, O oh Lord, my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best, O oh, my day. Waking or sleeping, thy presence, my love. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Thou in me dwelling, and I be one. Be thou my battleship, sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my Riches I need not, no man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance, now and no ways. Thou and thou we first in my heart. I hear. My victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O oh bright heaven sun. Heart of my own heart, ever be born. 
Still be my vision, O ruler of all. Okay, beautiful hymn, one of my favorites. It was just a beautiful hand and it speaks volumes come thou fount of every blessing come thou fount of every blessing tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon Mount of God's redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope I Thy good pleasure safely to abide. Jesus, don't be when a stranger wandering from the throne of God. He to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. To grace, how great a debtor daily and constraints to pay. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to be prone to wander, Lord. I feel it prone to leave. God, I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts of God. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts of Here at the Grand Ole Opry House, hardly a Saturday night goes by without at least a couple of gospel songs ringing out through these rafters. Country, bluegrass, and gospel, well, they go together. And tonight, they come together in a trio of performances featuring some of the best-loved artists around. Starting us off are longtime Opry members, my buddies Ricky Skaggs and the Whites. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground. Sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, 
my anchor holds within the bay. His hope, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I live in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness among all blessed to stay before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for all that you do and all that you provide for us. Father, thank you for the warmth of the sunshine, the coolness of the breeze. Father, thank you for the protection that you give to us every moment of every day, Father. Thank you for the healing that you provide for us, whether it be physical, mental, spiritual, financial, or in, in relationships, Lord. Your healing touch shows your power and your mercy. Father, be with those who are facing illnesses, surgeries, facing cancers, facing any kind of health problem. Just ask that you put your loving, healing arms around them and let them know of your presence in ways that only you can do. Father, thank you for your protection, for your love, for you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. This morning's message is getting inside your defenses and it's based on Ephesians chapter 6 and specifically I want to look at verses uh, 11 and 12. But I'm going to read the whole chapter of Ephesians 6. It is a warfare chapter, okay? And that's what we're going to be talking about today, is spiritual warfare. And we're going to tell you how to get into it and how to be victorious, okay? Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admission of the lord servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto christ not with eye service as men pleasers but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with him. Finally, my brethren. Okay, these are the verses I want you to pay specific attention to. 
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord as in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins, go about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, and to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak, but that ye also may know my affairs, and how I do. Tychius, a beloved brother, and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs, and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from the God, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with God, grace, grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. And we will get to more on that scripture as we go through the message. Military experts say that there was a point in time when the Soviet Union had developed and positioned the most effective anti-aircraft system in the world. Powerful radars sniffed the air above major Soviet cities. Missiles were poised for any altitude. None of the cities was more heavily defended in that system as was Moscow and its famous Red Square just outside the Kremlin, the seat of the communist government. Surrounded by what was called the Ring of Steel, Moscow had belts and missile placements located at about 10, 25, and 45 nautical miles out. They could not imagine a scenario for which they had not prepared. Everyone everywhere believed Moscow to be impenetrably safe until May 28, 1987, that is. That was the day when a 19-year-old German named Matthias Rust piloted a single-engine Cessna airplane from Helsinki, Finland, across Soviet territory, buzzed the Kremlin, and then landed in Red Square within spitting distance of Lenin's tomb. You can see photos of this on Google Images, okay? That's Rust leaning against his rented airplane. Before he was taken away by the KGB, by the KGB he managed to draw a crowd of admirers who even asked for autographs. When the incident was over, the daring young German was elated. The Russian government was embarrassed, and the world was very amused. What was interesting about this is that Russ made no attempt to evade radar. His intrusion into Soviet airspace was detected hundreds of miles before he landed. MiG fighter jets had done flybys marking the Cessna long before it approached the capital city. But it was deemed harmless, nothing worth getting excited about. In fact, in the handoff report between the Leningrad commander and his Moscow counterpart, there was no mention of the Cessna. So at about 6 p.m., when Rust, when Rust reached the outskirts of Moscow, military leadership had a huge problem. The city's airspace was completely restricted. No overflights, either military or civilian, were allowed. Radar controllers that picked up the Cessna's approach realized that something was terribly wrong. 
but it was too late for them to act. And 43 minutes later, Matthias Rust put his plane down in the very heart of the Soviet Union. In the aftermath of this defensive collapse, enormous effort was given to identify how this was even possible. It was not just so their minds could have an answer for why this happened, but they wanted to apply what could be learned from this failure so that it could never happen again. The final report called for procedures to be rewritten, radar stations to be recalibrated, and hundreds of replacements along command lines. Officers ranging from revered war heroes down to the lowest ranks were discharged or replaced in what was the biggest turnover in the Soviet military command since Stalin's bloody purge of the late 1930s. Stories like this fascinate me on many levels, but there are two things that stand forward for you and me this morning. Number one, we are more vulnerable than we think. We are more vulnerable than we think. I'm not just talking about our nation. Although America has had far more lethal lessons on vulnerability than the one I just recounted. No, I'm talking about our personal lives. We've all seen that couple whose marriage, from all outward appearances, was inviolable. Yet they're calling it quits. We've all come to expect a surprise when the private choices of public figures force themselves into the light of day and we must redraw the image we had of them. The tales are far too common and the tragedies far too painful. How many strong, vibrant reputations and relationships and careers and ministries have been shipwrecked. Political figures, celebrities, sports personalities, religious leaders, CEOs, and the guy next door. They let something into their airspace that at the time seemed controllable and harmless. It was no big deal, they reasoned. Every scenario is covered. No real threat exists. And suddenly, it's too late. Here's the first lesson I learned from a guy who landed in Red Square. We're not as strong as we think we are. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 makes this plain enough. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Secondly, we are careless. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 6 points to the spiritual disintegration of Israel and then tells us these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Why is this the man, the woman, the teenager who turns from the wreckage of someone else's sin only to look for similar cracks in their own defenses? The Russians sifted every detail and restructured entire systems in order to prevent future intrusions. But so... So many who profess to be Christians see no reason to examine their defenses or make any real changes in their behavior, surrounded though we are by those whose lives have been invaded. We just resolve to be more careful, cross our fingers, and continue on. Same attitudes, same friends, same choices, same worldliness. Here's the critical question I want to pose this morning. If Satan were to blow you out of the water, how do you think he would do it? If he could ruin your reputation, silencing your testimony, if he could lethally poison your marriage and foster bitterness in your family, if he was able to end your career or ministry, what would be his approach? Where is the critical weakness? In the care of souls, yours and mine, I want us to, ex to assess ourselves in the light of Scripture. I don't want another person, not another couple or family, to become a casualty in this spiritual war. With defensive failures all around us, it's time to take the measure of our maturity. What does spiritual maturity have to do with fighting off temptation? Let me take you to the single most important passage on battle tactics in the Bible. Bible. It's Ephesians 6, as I read at the beginning. 
As God uses Paul to write this letter, the apostle has been in Roman prison for almost five years. He is a political hostage, locked away from the Jews who want to get rid of him by the Romans who don't know what to do with him. It's obvious that Paul is no stranger to frontline combat in the spiritual realm. He knows how easy it is for a defensive failure to take place in lives and churches. So he writes Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 20. For our purposes, we're concentrating on verses 10 through 12. And if you like an outline of what is written, there is the, there is the call to arms, the command to stand, and the contender to defeat. If you want to write those down, I'll say them again. There is the call to arms, the command to stand, and the contender to defeat. That's our outline. Okay, The call to arms. The call to arms. Verse 10 of Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Let me say verse 10 two more times. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. This is an imperative, a call to arms, a command. As a Christian, you have a mandate from God himself. Compliance is not optional. You are in a war zone. There are no qualifiers to unflinching obedience, no leave of absence from the battle, and no tolerance for AWOLs. For those not familiar with the term AWOL, that's a military term, and it means absent without leave. Okay. The core command. The core command is to be strong. This ought to make us stop and pay attention. When Paul tells you to be strong, he's telling you that something's coming. What's coming isn't a 19-year-old amateur pilot. He's scary and powerful and knows how to invade your life. Every word from Paul matters here. So let's notice three important truths that are packed into this verb, be strong. Number one, you are not the source of this power. You are not the source of this power. Be strong can sound like a pep talk from the coach before the game, but the language of the New Testament is very precise. The power does not come from within you and me. You are a channel, not the source, and that's really good news because of what we're up against. You and I will be overpowered, outmaneuvered, and outsmarted on our own. Our strength is inadequate for this fight. If I were to update this in a secular way, we could, we could borrow from the lips of Dirty Harry, the cop made famous by Clint Eastwood. In one of his movies, he said, a man's got to know his limitations. Well, Paul said it first, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. The resurrected Christ is the dynamo. Be strong, or more accurately, be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 echoes this. Read it aloud with me. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Read it aloud with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's read it again. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One more time. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Secondly, you ought to be getting stronger. You ought to be getting stronger. What Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 is not a one-time show of power. It is an increasing building kind of strength. In other words, the longer you are a Christian, the stronger you ought to be spiritually. The reality is there are believers who have walked with Christ for decades that seem weaker than new Christians of just a few years. Their spiritual growth and strength 
hit a plateau long ago. Instead of being the go-to people in the body of Christ, they are instead known for patterns of sin, for fear, gossip, cynicism, pride, and a love of power. Listen, the book of Hebrews is talking to some of us this morning when it says, by this time, you ought to be teachers, but have need for someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the world in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Look at Hebrews chapter 5 verses 12 through 13. You don't grow strong by attending committee meetings, critiquing ministries, and coasting. You get stronger when you personally join the sometimes messy front lines of ministry. Which brings me to the third truth. You are to put the strength to the test. You are to put the strength to the test. The word of the Holy Spirit, the word, the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to use means, proven strength, battle tested ability. This is not bodybuilder strength. When you pump iron so you can flex in front of the mirror, this is not theoretical strength for armchair Christians who talk a big game in the boardroom and throw their weight around behind the scenes, but are always conspicuously absent when actual ministry with people takes place. No, Jesus equips you for the kind of hand-to-hand -hand battles that come up when you take risks in the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Makes this, co makes this connection clear. But she will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is power to fulfill the Great Commission. Do a study through Acts. You will find that the apostles were filled with the Spirit as they were given opportunity to speak. His power flows through me when I bear witness to Christ. No witness, no risk, no wrestling with people's sinfulness, no getting involved with people's lives with the gospel intention, then no power. The muzzle gets hot when it's fired. When you open your mouth, he will fill it. When you roll up your sleeves in Jesus' name, you see him working through you. Here are your orders. Get fortified in the Lord so that you are prepared for anything as you risk yourself in the cause of Christ. Allow him to give you his strength. Why? Because something's coming. Something's coming. This is the call to arms. So what are we up against? We now come to the contender to defeat. Verses 11 through 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The worst enemy you have is this one whom Paul calls the devil, who is Satan himself, the evil one, the one who first tempted Eve in the garden, the one who accuses every believer, the one who stands before God to hurl accusations against you now and at the end of time, the one who has opposed all believers in all ages. He is active and personal and intensely focused on how to ruin you, corrupt you, turn you, break you. Paul warns us about the schemes of the devil. The word is methodia, which is always used in the New Testament in a bad sense. In fact, in the second century AD, the church used the word methodia to describe the systematic torture of Christian martyrs. The word refers to an orderly, logical, effective plan that involves deceit and cunning to entice and ensnare. Think of a carefully orchestrated plan of attack with a specific target. And you have a gist of what Paul is describing. Highly organized, very determined. When you stir in the ranks of demonic spiritual forces in verse 12, you get the picture. There is a malevolent 
evil being who has sought against you. If you've ever wondered why you find worship boring, ever questioned why it's so hard to get up in the morning and spend time with the Lord, ever thought about why every time you want to show your faith, fear crops up. Look no further. Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. He hates your marriage and wants to kill it. He hates your children and wants to trap them. He despises the church and wants to neutralize it. He has your picture and your vital information on a table in his war room, strategizing how best to invade your life. This is why we need the strength of the Lord, which becomes ours as we put on the full armor of God. We now come to the command to stand. Verse, first part of verse 11 gives us the second command. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Look carefully at this order and what it requires. Number one, you are to dress, you are to dress out immediately. That's the first order. You are to dress out immediately. Put on means clothe yourself, dress out, get this equipment on. And the emphasis is do it now. Move it. Hurry. There is an urgency here. Why? Because something's coming and you cannot handle it in your own strength. Suit up. Gear up. Okay. Secondly, you are issued the armor of God. Many, many believe that Paul is drawing his analogy from the Roman soldiers to whom he was chained. But Paul also knew the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 59 verses 15 through 17, we read about God himself as a warrior fighting to deliver his people. Notice the description of what God is wearing. The Lord saw that there was no man and wondered that there was that there was no one to intercede. Then in his own arm, then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on a garment of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. So this is the armor of God, not just because he supplies it, but because he wears it. God's Messiah wore the same armor the same armor available to you. Now listen carefully, because along with these orders, Paul is about to reveal the secret weapon in the war of souls. This is the weapon that holds back the darkness and advances the kingdom of God in his power. In verses 14 through 17, we read the description of the six pieces of armor with prayer as our connection to command headquarters in verses 18 through 20. What is the nature of this armor? The various pieces are about truth and obedience, about remembering your place of peace before God, about exercising faith in God and His promises, about salvation that governs our choices, and about learning to wield the Word of God like the Spirit-empowered sword it is. All these aspects are about your Christian life. What is more, Notice the purpose, the goal of being fully covered in the armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the devil. The word stand means to dig in, to hold your ground, to not give an inch. No territory lost. I won't be knocked off course. I will stay steady, fixed, immovable. Put these together and you begin to realize what Paul was talking about. The great supernatural weapon of which Paul writes is you. You and I fend off the schemes of the devil and stand our ground by our consistent, serious devotion to Christ, by a life fixed in the truth of God, a life that is holy as he is holy. I am armed against Satan when I witness, when I trust the promises of God's word, I am made strong in the Lord through knowing and practicing his battle manual, the Bible. Spiritual warfare is a matter of personal spiritual growth and maturity. You are God's secret weapon in the war of souls. Which brings out several questions as we think about measuring our maturity. Is God's secret weapon in the wrong hands this morning? 
is God's secret weapon in the wrong hands this morning. In my life, a righteous weapon. Is my life a righteous weapon empowered by Christ? Or would it be more honest to say that my choices, my actions, my attitudes make me a weapon of unrighteousness through a worldly lifestyle? Am I presenting my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God? Or are your body parts given up in service to fleshly interest? Look at Romans chapter 12 verse 1. Romans chapter 6 verses 13 through 14. As I am I growing stronger as I grow older in the Lord, or has my spiritual progress stalled? You are either a channel of God's power and purpose and the unfolding of His plan, or you are an obstacle that hinders His will. There is no middle ground. More than once, Jesus made this clear. No one can serve two masters, for either He will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. That's Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. That's Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. Jesus' half-brother James echoes the same thing. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's from the book of James chapter 4 verse 4. As we search ourselves before God's word this morning, I think all of us need to be asking, Oh God, does the way I treat my wife, raise my children, do my work, give my tithe, serve others, does it open doors for you? Advance your kingdom, raise up Christ. Or am I winking at intrusive temptations, assuming that I can manage the consequences and allowing something in that can mess up everything? Hear the word of our King. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of of light. That's Romans chapter 13 verse 12. This has been Empty Cross Ministries Biblical Focal Points online worship service. I'm Brother David, the pastor, CEO, and founder of Empty Cross Ministries. Stay tuned next week as we continue our series on spiritual maturity. Getting inside your defenses has been the message, and I hope you were blessed by it as I was, and I hope you learned as much as I did. Stay safe, be blessed, stay in the Word, and write the Word upon your heart. We're going to close out with victory in Jesus.
And somehow Jesus came and brought me to my victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and brought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He comes me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. I heard about a mansion. He is real for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and brought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He comes me to victory beneath the cleansing.